Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Soul Seekers podcast, where we believe that hunting has the power to transform lives through primal adventure, as we share our mission of mentorship is conservation. To learn more about everything we do, check out our show on Carbon TV, or go to soulseekersnation.com. Freedom on, everybody, and stay soulful. This podcast is also proudly brought to you by Onyx Hunt. When I first got into hunting, I kept hearing all about public land and different access and how to find different locations to hunt. I was like, well, how are people even identifying all this stuff? Well, sure enough, I came across the number one hunting GPS app, and that is Onyx Hunt. If you guys want to want to get better at hunting and, and go deeper into your scouting, Onyx Hunt is the number one GPS app for that. Join the millions of hunters who trust Onyx Hunt to find more game, discover new access, and hunt smarter. It was a game changer for me, and I know it's going to be a game changer for you if you've never used it. If you have used it, you know the power that it holds. Guys, I really hope you enjoy this episode. If you want to know more about Onyx Go to onyxmaps.com forward slash hunt and check out their app. Be blessed, freedom on, and stay soulful. All right, guys, if you're in the market for a new hunting rifle this coming year, look no further than a Kelbley's rifle. I've been rocking their Coda rifle for the last couple seasons and I've had great success with it. It's an amazing shooter. And every time I put one of their rifles in somebody's hands, they're like, oh, I got to get one of these. Kelbley's holds over 92 world and national records that are either broken or set on one of their actions or rifles. So they really set a higher level of accuracy. If you want to know more about Kelbley's rifles, go to kelbley.com. That's K-E-L-B-L-Y.com. Tell them Johnny Mac sent you with Soul Seekers. And uh, go enjoy shooting that much more in this coming hunting season. Be blessed, everybody. Go check out Kelbley Rifles. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Soul Seekers Podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Mack, and today's episode is for all of you who have ever thought about, man, I can't find the ammo on the shelf that I want. Man, I should probably get into reloading. Or isn't reloading cheaper than buying factory (laughs) ammo? Or any other question that you might have ever had when it comes to the projectiles that come out of the things that go boom, which we all love and uh, is so much fun to participate in, especially since Wednesday was, or no, Thursday was uh, Independence Day. And so speaking about things that go boom, uh, we're, yeah. we're doing a reloading episode. And our t- guest for today is Zach May. He is uh, the man behind the YouTube channel Reloading Quest on, on YouTube. And if you haven't checked it out, go check it out. He's got a lot of cool information. He's also an outdoor writer and writes for several magazines that you potentially subscribe to or read. And so without further ado, we're going to invite Zach on and talk all about his journey in shooting, hunting, reloading, and so much more. Brother, great to have you on. Thanks for uh, joining the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, bud. It is an absolute pleasure, man. What What I love about podcasting, we're just hanging out. We're just yeah, yeah. we're just shooting the breeze, getting to talk about the things that we love to talk about. So, what'd you do for Independence Day? Um, so I uh, I work a fireworks booth for the wife. Um, mon- or basically Sunday through a um, little bit into Thursday, and we sold out basically everything by like Thursday afternoon. And they said I had I had stuff set aside for us, and then so we went over to a friend's house. We had a barbecue, and then. Went off a ton of fireworks with family, and it was awesome. Dude, yeah. that's awesome. Is so, uh, fireworks yeah. as lucrative as it used to be? Uh, yes, it is. Well, and it's for the museum. So my wife's a director for the mu- local museum here. And so it's a fundraiser for them. And so I think we get a lot more people coming in and getting them, and they get to keep a lot of the profit for it. So it's it's pretty lucrative. That's awesome. They're uh, Graxaw game bags. Uh, Graxaw, if mm-hmm. you ever heard of them. Um, yep. Austin. He's been a guest on the podcast. We use his game bags here. Um, mm-hmm. He also runs a fireworks stand. <laughs> so, okay, right so on. I'm like, yeah. I need to get it's in. pretty fun. <laughs> I need to get in this business. <laughs> I mean, I don't get to keep any of the money, but it's a lot. It's a lot of fun, and man, it's it's actually pretty pretty impressive. Like you know, I you know, you think you spent a lot on ammo. That's why you want to get reloaded. Whatever. You should see what people spent on fireworks. <laughs> yeah, <ain't> that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man, I, the dad in me. 
wants to say working out of fireworks stands a real blast, but don't. Yeah. Yeah. Sh- I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love yeah, it. Yeah, a little dad, little dad joke. Yeah, yeah, there you go. All right, so brother, uh, you and I met mm-hmm. uh, this last shot show down in Las Vegas, Nevada at the 22 Creedmoor dinner. That was when you and I got to really connect. And then ever since then, yep. it's been fun chatting with you and shooting messages yep. back and forth and all that stuff. Um, you are actually from the state of Washington, which is I, I am ironic that I left and here yep. you are living this freedom life in a state that is not so free when it comes to firearm laws because they're constantly passing things to to keep you down. Yeah, they're they're trying to keep us down, but man, like you can see in my background, it says live free, die free. That's right, baby. So yeah. Yep. So I didn't realize that the you know the the flag with the cannon on it says come and take yep. it. I didn't realize yep. that's a Texas flag. Yeah. So the, once I got into uh, Texas state history a little bit more, and I realized that that was full on the whole come and take it was all about the Mexican army wanting to take a cannon away from a village. Okay, um, and, I didn't know. I didn't know that actually. And, and so they said, "We're not surrendering. Coming, and, come and take it." And okay. ev- everyone died. But it was a phenomenal stance <laughs> of, of sovereignty and be yeah. like, "No, we're living the way we want to live." Uh-huh. Anyways, let's shift gears here. Let's talk about um, your journey in the outdoors, hunting and reloading. So I know hunting, mm-hmm. reloading for you have kind of gone hand in hand. You've had some uh, amazing mentors when it comes to your history and growing up of, yep. of the outdoors. So lay, lay it on us. What, what is your history when it comes to firearms and hunting? So when I, I grew up hunting a lot with my uncle and a couple other family friends. And when I was 10, I got in really big into hunting and reloading with my uncle a lot and uh, shooting a 30 out six and wanted to figure out, you know, uh, there's gotta be a better way to do this and make my, my rifle more accurate. And so my uncle's like, Hey, I'll teach you how to do it. And so I did that with him for like three years. And then I turned 13 and he's like, yeah, you're good enough to do it on your own. Go ahead at it. And so it kind of, I kind of just did it and it grew into something I'd love to do. I relax relaxes me and uh-huh. i uh i just i really love it and the other the other thing is is it's it's something to tinker and i'm a huge tinker when it comes to come to that stuff and it and it just engages my mind and so i was like you know what this is something that i love to do and so i 13 to 23 you know i'm working full time and then I'm still reloading, reloading, and reloading. I want to figure out a way to eke out the best I can get out of my rifle. Yeah. I love I love shooting it. I love sitting down and shooting bench rests, but also I like to go out and shoot long range. I also hunt. And I want to make sure that my my cartridge, whatever I'm loading, is going to do what it's capable to do and meet that maximum accuracy I can so that when I am shooting a, an animal potentially at 400 yards, I am not going to make a mistake. I can't blame it on my rifle. I can't blame it on my ammo. If I wound something, it's on me. And so that's kind of. And at what age did you, did you say you realize all this and have this aha moment? Well, at like 10 years old, you know, I was with my uncle and then 13, I was doing on my own and like 16 years old to, I don't know, 16 to probably 18. I was like, you know, this, this makes more sense to to be doing it this way. And then I really dove into about right right when I was 23, probably, because I really wanted to eke out the most for my rifles. And that's probably right when it kicked in. Right Dude, around that's there. incredible. I'll tell you, that's very mature of you and, and very impressive that you had such foresight at that age to be like, I know I can do well, this better. Well, I also hunted with a lot of people that made bad shots, made mistakes, and bl- blamed it on ammo or blamed it on their rifle. Um, you know, and so that's, I just feel like if you're going to be hunting, you have to give you, you have as a grown adult or just whoever mentor, you need to be giving that animal a good clean death. In my opinion, that is probably going to be the best way of ensuring your equipment is working right. Yeah. That's how you got to do it. Yeah. Dude, that's so. awesome. So, so many questions like where, where yeah. do we begin? Where do we begin? First mm-hmm. off, I want to hear a little bit more about this, this hunting journey that led you in to the reloading. So okay. at what point, um, and, and so talk about that, but then talk about this, this introduction to reloading. Like 
Uh, what, okay. Was it was it this whole, hey, you got to reload if you want to ha- be the most accurate, or is it this ammo really sucks, or the ammo is so expensive it's way cheaper to reload? What what is this this journey that you went on from hunting? You talked about a, seeing a lot of bad shots be taken. Yeah. Like, yep. talk talk about your journey. Well, so growing up, like I said, I hunted a lot with my uncle. And when I was 13, my dad went and bought me a Remington 710 30-06 from Walmart. I saved up $310, had a 3 by 9 Bushnell on it. Not a good quality rifle, but I tell you what, to this day, it's still one of my most accurate rifles I own. I actually just replaced that scope two weeks ago on that thing <laughs> because it, it, it finally went. But I've killed more animals with that gun because I know – how it shoots but that's with my hand loads it always shot remington core locks a 180 grand remington core lock really well anything else it was very temperamental you know two inch groups at 100 150 yards which i don't like personally that's not that's not for me what i think is acceptable for a hunting rifle and so you know a lot of people go well aim at the vitals you got eight inches on eight inches on a deer well that's yeah, I guess, but well, what if you're off? You're shooting off hand. You're not shooting on sticks. You're not laying down prone. It's really easy to make a mistake and then gut shot that animal and it runs away. And so it, my uncle was like, well, we can make this more accurate. And so what do we do? We, we free flowed the barrel. Okay, that made the, that made the rifle right there. It went from shooting a two, two and a half inch group right down to an inch and a half group. And then I was like, well, what else can we do, Larry? And he's like, well, we can hand load for it. So we went down the journey of, developing a load for it and that's kind of where it started right there just learning and then once i once i discovered how accurate you can make just a 300 hundred dollar rifle just by doing proper load development i was sold on that man that's incredible so and then reloading is like it's a whole journey in itself because you can stay very yep. basic level primers Correct. powder um powder charges Yep. And, and kind of just leave it at that versus yep. primer pocket, uh, yep. seating depth, like a you, combination of all this other stuff. Like you, you can make reloading as simple or as difficult as you want it yeah. or not even difficult. I mean, like just in depth as you want, you know, if, if, if you just want to develop a cartridge for your 308 Winchester and you want to shoot a one inch group, well, most of the time that you're gonna be able to get that from factory ammo. Mm-hmm. Factory ammo, since I was 13, that was a, quite a while ago. I won't even say how long now. But from there till now, it's it's improved so much. Horny makes great stuff. Federal makes great stuff. Um, but if you're looking to eke out the best way you can, hand loading, reloading is going to be the best method. And should you should you uh, you know ram your primer pockets and clean them every time? Well, do you have to? No, but you know, why not go that step to just improve that one extra thing that takes you just, you know, a second each one. Hmm, interesting. So, you know, do you mind if I share my journey into reloading? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. So back in, well, it, 10 years ago is when I took my hunter safety. So it was probably nine years ago when I, yep. when I started my reloading process and yep. that was when Obama was president and ammo yep. was very hard to find. Yep. Uh, it was hard to find ammo. I was getting into hunting. At this time, I had a 22 long rifle. I had my very first AR-15. Okay. I had a 9 millimeter pistol and a 22 long mm-hmm. rifle pistol. Like, that, those okay. are my firearms. And that's the easiest stuff to find ammo for. That stuff that you just said. Yes. Yep. Yes, exactly. Yep. And so I was like, well, I'm, I want to get a hunting rifle. Um, I want to get into hunting, but I love shooting because I'm a shooter also. Yep. Um, AR-15s are awesome. Dude, there's a thing called an AR-10. And this was back when yeah. AR-10s oh, yeah. were not very common. Now they're, you know, yeah. ev- they're everywhere. Yeah. Yep. And so I got a, an AR-10 and 308. And that mm-hmm. was my very first hunting rifle. Okay. And, and so I was like, well, I need to start getting 308 ammo. But at that time, it was very hard for me to find it. And my Mm -hmm. wife at the time, who newly married, uh, her father actually reloaded. And so he started to just share with me, like, he loved to reload everything's 30 out six with him, you know, like, hey. Sounds like an awesome guy. (laughs) I would get along with him, amazing, as I think, probably. (laughs) And so he took me down to his room and, 
it was um, a single stage RCBS press yep. oh, with rock chucker probably a, a rock chucker press with a yep. powder charge that you had to lift up and then lift down mm -hmm. and it would spit it out and like I'm, I'm looking at this i'm like dude this is awesome i can find yeah. if i can find the bullets and i can get brass and and so i started out not necessarily like reading any reloading books or pamphlets or information it was uh, more or less i wanted 308 rounds he being a 30-06 guy, also reloaded for 308. And yep. so it was, um, what, IMR 60-40 or 68-40 or something like that? Uh, IMR, IMR uh, 40, uh, could have, uh, 60, oh, Blue Can? Yes. Blue Can? Yes. <laughs> IMR, R, R, IMR 40-64. 40-64, there you go. Yeah, and yeah. He, I was like, wait a second, let's, let's <laughs> figure out the color of the can first. <laughs> yeah. And he was like, yeah, this is the powder that I use, and here we go. And so yep. I was like, oh, I this, this is the powder for 308. Like, this is what you yeah. buy. Not knowing that what, now that I've been married for 11 years and, you know, he has boxes of bullets and primers that say like 99 cents on them and oh, you know, wow. like stuff that's yeah. super, super old. Yeah. He's been holding on to for quite some time. Um, yeah. And, and I'm like, OK. And so I I prime a brass. I would powder charge it. I'd see. Mm -hmm. And it was just slow process, slow process. Yeah. But then all of a sudden I had, you know, 50 rounds and I could go shoot mm -hmm. my gun and and we were off to the races. And so at that point, I was like, okay, I need to get my own reloading process because it, he lived an hour and a half away from me. And if I was ever going to get more ammo, he had to drive. I, <laughs> yeah. had to go drive hour and a half along the I-5 corridor, which, you know, yeah. is, is yeah. miserable. So, yep. so I was like, oh man. So I went and bought a, a rock trucker press. At this time, mm -hmm. I realized, I was like, oh, you, there's electronic uh, powder charge dispensers. <laughs> I, I bought a charge master um, mm -hmm. and just kind of went through this process of figuring out exactly, you know, the cheapest, easiest way to get into reloading. So here I was reloading, um, but I didn't, I already was like reloading pre-made brass that you'd buy in bags at Cabela's. You know, yeah, like, okay. like bags yep. of 500, 308 yep. rounds. So once I shot through all that and I'm starting to reload my process. Mm -hmm. Now, people who listen to this might think like, man, J-Mac might be very oh. ignorant or really stupid because I was more concerned about the danger of over powder charging anything yep. than I was about any other process. So okay. I'm, I'm cleaning brass, I tumble it, I pop the primers, I size it, I put powder, or reprime it, put powder in, and I'm like, okay, good to go. Not knowing that when I resize the brass, it actually made it longer. <laughs> Grew. So yeah. here I am, I go shooting, and this is a long story, and I apologize for my, <laughs> for my monologue. No. no, you're all good. So I, I go shooting, and all of a sudden... <clears throat> Bam! I shoot. And because I'm shooting AR-10, I'm relying on a, a bolt to, to automatically grab that Extract. brass. And Extract it's, it out, and yeah. it's not popping out. And I'm, mm -hmm. like, I'm like, what's going on? So my brass was way too long, and I ended up jamming into my, uh, my breech or, or whatever. And it, yeah. Yeah. And well, you're 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 lucky you didn't overpressurize it. So you're worried about you're worried about blowing it up from powder when you when you have excess length. That's the whole reason you're supposed to trim your brass, right? Because mm -hmm. if you jam that jam that in, there's a little bit of wiggle room there. And when you jam that in, it also can potentially hold that bullet tighter too, right? Or crush that. Yeah. And so now there, it takes more force for it to leave. So I mean, Lord God, that yeah. Th yeah. thank Him that I still have two <laughs> hands and a face and like whatever because the gun could have blown up, and that was yeah. my first like introduction into. There's a whole lot more to this than I even know. Yeah. Um, so how'd you get how'd you get it out, dude? I had to travel with a gun. I took the upper off, so I separated yep. it from from yeah. uh that. And thank the good Lord that it was an AR-10 that I could yeah. do that because I had to travel home with the casing 
in the Still. barrel and then stick find a, a rod long enough that was and strong enough to like just jam, jam that it out. out yeah yeah from the muzzle it's yeah. crazy yeah oh yeah so that was my introduction to reloading and now i'm sitting here with uh the nosler nine book um, okay yeah the reloading guide and it's so cool to actually see everything that's in there it's also really impressive like and such a pain in the tushy at the same time uh that more new cartridges come out and then you're like, okay, well, now I got to go get more updated information. And <laughs> well, if you don't mind me plugging something real quick, plug, plug away. Uh, so loaddata.com, like literally, I think it's a third, I think it's $30 subscription and you will have more load data than you'll ever need. Really? That's it's a, it's amazing. Um, like all these, all the, like, so like basically all the articles that come out of hand loader, you know, rifleman's journal and stuff, all that information goes into that. And so you get data upon data upon data in there. So that's, that's a great way to do it. Um, you know, Hodgson's always, he's got their website too, right? Yep. That's a really good one. And that one's free. Um, and Hornady, when they like, so when they put out stuff for like that seven PRC, Hornady had actual load data that you could just print. And so that's what I do. Did they take it down? Um, no. Oh, it's still there. I know of them. Okay. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> it it should it. be there. That's awesome. It should be there. Okay. So I just yeah. pulled up loaddata.com and, and sure enough, yep. here, here you go. So yep. that, that was my introduction into reloading. And okay. sen since that time, it was always like, okay, um, here, here we go down this road of trial and error it seemed like it seemed like it was uh -huh. more it got to be more of a hassle because okay. i didn't have a range handy so it wasn't like i uh -huh. can load up a couple and then go to the range and test it out and then be like okay now i know what i want to do with the rest it was drive an yeah. hour and a half make sure you load up enough until you're going to be yep. here the next time yep um and then just real quick i got into reloading pistol ammo and i didn't uh -huh. realize that the powder charges on pistols were different for the length of barrel slide. And so I had ones that weren't reciprocating a longer slide, but they shot great in my EDC carry, you know? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So you can kind of nag it, nag, uh, get around that by changing the springs on your, you know, your, um, on the, pistol. the guide springs. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you can get around it by that, but yes, there is lots to do it. So, so, so going back to your your journey, your story, you, mm -hmm. it was all about finding and making your gun the most accurate. Yeah. So, take us through the process. I mean, obviously, uh, a re this is not a reloading course where you're able yeah. to explain all the ins and outs of everything. We're going to keep this very, yep. very, very basic one on one style. Um, okay. What what were the pieces of gear that you needed, you wanted, that helped you really dial in? Where did you go for resources? And, and we'll start there. So first thing I will tell you, buy quality reloading gear. That's I've learned. I mean, I have owned now 21 different presses. Really? Not because they've broken, just because I have found advantages over certain ones. And it's kind of like a lot of stuff they say, buy one, cry, cry once. That's yep. kind of how, I, how I've gotten, in, gotten into feeling about this. Now, you could go with a Lee uh, load all. There ain't nothing wrong with it. If you just really want to load ammo, you can get into it for like $200. Mm -hmm. But you're going to be messing with it. It's going to be finicky. Um, you're just going to be half the time reloading and half the time fixing, in my opinion. Yeah. So... Uh, how I, I, that was, that's what I started with. And I had that thing for two months and I was like, mm, it's, it's gone. That's saving up for something else. So I went on and I was on Craigslist because we didn't have Facebook marketplace at that time. Yep. Right. Kind of thing. So Craigslist, um, I found a RCBS rock checker and went from that. And that was my main press for the longest time. Um, and then, uh, you can get, I got into the Dylan's, the progressive presses, uh, the, I am a huge fan of a, a coaxial press where your case sits in and then floats and the die floats. So as you come down, everything self aligns, helps with run out and stuff like that. So you have the Forrester coax press. You ha also have the RCBS summit press, which are amazing. Um, powder dispensing. There is a lot of ways to do that. Um, I, I have found when it comes to accuracy, the 
to being to being dialed on your powder accuracy makes a huge difference. Reloading in a, a controlled environment makes a huge difference. Uh, go, you can get electronic scales that will throw to a certain amount, and then you can go from there to weighing it on a different scale and then topping it off. It all depends on how precise you want to be mm. with that. So um, when it comes to, uh, you know, how did I decide on what stuff? My uncle was just like, uh, just buy whatever. <laughs> so I just uh, <laughs> bought whatever right. for the first time. And I, and I kind of wish he would have had a more opinion because I, you know, I, like I said, I messed with the press for a while. Um, I didn't like it and went to RCBS and, um, now I'm a big, big proponent. I, so like I'm staring at my loading bench right now. I have two Dillon progressive presses. I've got a Hornady single stage press. I got a Forrester coax press, a summit, uh, RCBS press and an RCBS rock checker. Ooh. I use all of those. Um, just, it depends on what application I'm running. It, uh, it is the progressives like the Dillons, are those going to give you the precision that you want, or is it more to yes. mass production and and stuff? That it's, it's both. It is. It is both. Yes, um, you will get. I mean, there's tons of people like F Class John and Eric Cortina that reload their F Class rounds on the Dillons progressive presses. Huh. Um, the main thing is, is I would say if you're going to do that, just skip the sizing part of it on a progressive press. Size it on a single stage press. Uh, and, and then, and then do everything else from there. Um, you will speed up quite a bit, uh, and probably don't go with a powder drop. You can, depending on the powder, because powder drops are real finicky when it comes to stick powder versus ball powder, uh, ball powder just meters really well. Stick does not, but you also don't want to break a, a stick powder because then it changes the burn characteristics of it. So there's that. So even in, Yes. So even in, you know, how you kind of talk, um, you have one that you lift up and come back down. Yeah. You can still break the, the kernels in that. And so that can change it too. And one thing I found by doing this, I was getting crazy um, standard deviations. And I stopped doing that. And I went over to just doing a single a powder trickler by hand. And my standard deviations went to amazing. Really? And, and I don't know if that was, you know, it could have been a coincidence Maybe I maybe I was breaking the kernels. Maybe I wasn't. Uh, maybe just the the, the the what I was doing was way more precise. It could be that. Mm -hmm. but, um, there is there are more reloading equipment than anybody will ever be able to buy all ones. It's just it's kind of what's your flavor, what's your budget, and what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. um, if you want, if you know, if you want to get into USPSA shooting and you want your handgun, get yourself a seven a Dillon seven fifty and just go from there. Um, if you, you know, like, yeah, all I want to do is shoot nine mil for the rest of my life, go that way. Right. And then you can always get the heads, change them out and stuff like that. Uh, the main thing is, is keeping everything consistent. That's the key to the game. So I don't know if that answers your question, but, uh, I'm I might have, I might have floated around a little no, bit there. It's, but. it's really good information. Um, when, when it comes to like reloading, Mm -hmm. what are the pros and cons of why would somebody want to reload versus let's just, so, let's just go to the store and, and get some boxes of ammo. So like I said, so like, so like my, my YouTube channel is reloading quest. My whole goal is to find the best cartridge for every caliper I own because I want to be precise with it. I want to do the rifle justice, do the pistol justice. There's advantages when it comes to reloading to get the most out of your rifle. Um, will it save you money? Probably not right away mm -hmm. because you gotta, you gotta buy the equipment. And all that stuff. And powder's expensive. Primers really, you know, powder and primers are triple what they were five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, primer, you know, so it's it's almost as, you know, a lot of people say, well, I, re I reload so I can shoot more. That's probably the case for a lot of people. Um, when you get to where I'm at, uh, where I've been doing it so long, I am saving money. I'm you reusing my brass, you know, right? Um, uh, you know, obviously that's the only component that you can reuse because your primer's gone, you decap that, you know, your bolt, your projectile's down to range, and your powder should be burnt up by the time it leaves the barrel. If it's not, you're not reloading right. I'll tell you that right now. So <laughs> I got a question about that one. That, that's interesting. Um, so, uh, and it also affects your accuracy. And so that's really, you know, it, the way things are going with prices, uh, I think if you got into reloading, you're definitely going to save money down the road. Now, if you're the guy that shoots 6.5 Creedmoor 308, um, you know, five times a year right before your hunt, there's no point of reloading unless you want to get the most out of your rifle. 
um, at that point, you're not saving money. You're just getting what the most, the best potential out of your rifle is. Mm. You know, if you got 10 rifles and everybody in your family hunts and you know, you're, you're, you're going to save money, but you know, you're, you, if you go with a Dylan 750, you're looking at $1,200 to be set up for that. Right. Well, how, I don't know how many people actually spend $1,200 on ammo for the hunting rifle. I don't know how many people do that. Now, um, nowadays is way more common, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I mean, like you, I mean, like you're better off at that point going by and you're, if you find like, Hey, you know, the Remington core locks shoot really good in my rifle or this, uh, Hornady ELD actually is really good. Well, go back to that store and buy all the boxes of that lot they got <laughs> because then you're going to be good. Um, now if you're getting into long range, um, uh, I'm not going to say hunting because that's a different topic, long range shooting and, uh, precision stuff. That's where reloading gets in or bench rest. Or if your idea of having a good time is just going to the range and shooting for three hours, you will save money. Um, I do not count my time as reloading as like of the cost of reloading, because in my opinion, everybody has a hobby or something they would be doing. Mm -hmm. My, my daytime job is what my job is. My reloading time is me time, my relaxation time, my mental health time, I mean, everybody needs a break. Yeah. If you were to calculate, you know what, you know what I make on my average job, and then come in here and do it for an hourly wage. Yeah, it would probably I would not save money at all. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Uh, but as you do it, you get more precise. You get your methods down. You get rolling, and you turn on a baseball game, and you go to town. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, well, so I got I got a lot of questions lined up for you for this episode, but I want to go uh -huh. back to something that you said. So you said if you don't get all your powder burned up that is going to cause accuracy issues. Yes. It okay. Will. So accuracy, velocity issues, standard deviation issues, all that. Okay. Yep. So here, here's a, a right field question regarding mm -hmm. that. 300 blackout subsonic. Yes. I reload for that mm -hmm. with little gun, the shotgun powder. Yep. And it's like eight grains of it, like very yep. minimal. And I still have excess powder. What barrel length is why 16 inch with a suppressor yeah um then drop your charge weight down yeah so th you're saying there's never should be leftover powder your powder should be burned yeah by the time it leaves the barrel and there's calculations on how to do that to figure out what exactly you need hmm. are you familiar with gordon's reloading tool no I've heard of okay. it, but I don't know. Like this is this is why I said yes. this is a great episode for people so, that are like let's talk about this. We may need to have a different one on one <laughs> conversation <laughs> on the road. Uh, Gordon's reloading tool will be uh are are one of the best tools you can use for hand loading for data and stuff like that. Um it's it's pretty impressive. It you can give all the information and it'll tell you for what barrel length you should be at for burning and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Because the whole point, everybody, you know, you, I mean, yeah, growing up, oh, your barrel is longer. It makes it more accurate. No, that's not how that works because I, I literally have a 22 inch 300 blackout and then I have a 16 inch blackout. And that 16 spanks that 22 inch 300 blackout. Yeah. It's just is what it is. It's, it's, has nothing to do with your barrel length. Barrel length has to do with, um, you know, the velocity. Main, main thing is you're getting velocity and then helping that powder burn because you want that powder fully burnt. So if you're, if you shoot, and you do not, all your powder is not burned by the time you lose the barrel. It now is peppering the back of your projectile. Hmm. Because a, as that bullet leaves, you have unburnt powder coming out and whacking the end of your barrel, end of your bullet. And you have a, a pretty big muzzle flash, um, potentially not if you're running a can, depending on what can you're running. Um, but that's, and so if, at that point, it's unefficient. Um, and you can go to, you should be going to a different powder to get more efficient. Mm. If that makes sense. Yeah. You're, 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 you're literally not, not you in particular, but going with that charge weight and that you're literally wasting whatever extra powder could be going towards something else. If that makes sense. Yes. That no, yeah. makes sense. 100%. What kind, what kind of velocity are you getting? Let's just ask you that real quick. Oh man. You remember? No, it subs. It, it subs though. Well, that was an, that was another thing when it came to reloading is then I was mm -hmm. like, Oh, now I got to get a chronograph and now I got it, mm -hmm. you know? So yep. this, okay. it, it seemed like this at this po stage, when I came up with that load, I didn't even have a chronograph. It was, okay. I'm gotcha. looking at reloading books. And at that point, 300 blackout was relatively new. 
Yep. And everybody was doing it. Yeah. And so it's yep. like, okay, yep. well, you know, and it seems like in reloading data, everything's based off of a 26 inch barrel, right? Yeah. Or 24 inch barrel. 24 to 22 is the most common. Magnums might be 24 to 26. Okay. And I'm that's like, what the most common is. I'm like, okay. Yeah. And what's, what is six uh, or 16 inch? What is that going to do to that? Yeah. And so I had yep. all these questions that, you know, Nowadays, there's so many things like a podcast you could go to or yep. YouTube or different stuff, but I was so new into this type of game, and it's really changed within the last decade that I, oh, yeah. I didn't have that, nor did I search it up. You know, yeah. like I was to totally rookie, noob, um, yeah. ignorant, whatever you want to call it. Okay. And uh, th that also has to do with case capacity at that point because you want anywhere from like 90 to 95% case capacity. Um, so your, your ignition and burn will be good and it usually yields most the best accuracy. Now I've seen it where I have 70, 70, 70% case capacity and it shoots, you know, three quarter inch group all day long. And then you're just, okay, then that, I don't know what's going on there, but that's usually what you want. So what, when it, when it comes to reloading and accuracy, mm -hmm. bullet depth matters, powder yep. charge matters. Correct brass quality brass, matters br brass everybody gets hung up and like oh you can just go use you know some lake city brass picked up off at the range no you can but brass ex like we we'll use 308 um 308 for some reason like you can take 308 brass and it has the widest variety of case capacity you can grab some lapuas and then go grab a federal and there could be three grains different in case capacity hmm. and that's extremely dangerous when it comes to okay, well, I was shooting hot, and hot in uh, federal, and and I go and load it in Lapua. We'll say that Lapua is three grains less case, less case capacity. Well, now that's a really hot load. So a lot of that has to do with brass thickness, and yes, brass is a huge component to having repeatability and annealing. Annealing is huge. And what is that? Uh, your your so every time you fire uh, your cartridge and it comes out, it has been work hardened. And when you run it through your press, it makes it very difficult to do. So it hurts the, the longevity of your brass, and it also affects your uh, potential neck tension on it, and it also hurts just the overall um, hardness of the brass. So by annealing, you're softening that brass before you run it back through your die. So it's now easier, it's not being work hardened, and it helps retain its actual um, size because spring has mem. I mean, brass has memory. It springs back, like all metal, basically. So if you if you're sitting there just firing, see, you, you fired five pieces of brass. Well, it might not neck split, but it pretty much probably will. So if you're going and spending buying some alpha brass, some let's just say some six arc that I just got recently, it's one hundred and forty dollars for for one hundred pieces of brass. Well, you want that brass to last a long time and get the most out of it. So you want to anneal every firing uh, because it's going to help. It will help 100% with longevity. It will help with the neck tension, which will help in better accuracy. And it will help, it'll help with your, your, your extreme spreads and your standard deviation because you're helping with that neck tension. There's tons of other stuff that go along with that. But I don't want to go. To, I don't. I, I'll go down rabbit. I'll go down rabbit holes. <laughs> but uh, that's what anneal. The, the the real basics of annealing is. Okay. So, so. when I got uh, started looking at my father in law's brass and and finished cases and cartridges on his desk, um, mm -hmm. I noticed all of his cartridges collected dust, and I was like, "What is going on?" And I grabbed one, and it was like all waxy and sticky, yeah. and I was like. I was like, factory ammo doesn't come like this. What? He's yep. like, oh, you got to lube the cases before you put them in the press, and and I was like, well, then then your brass is just always sticky. That none of this really made sense to me until okay. I jammed and got stuck a couple of pieces of brass in my <laughs> in my dies. I've done that with loop, and that will help. I mean, uh, with annealing too, because you're not. Usually when you stick the brass is when you're pulling back out from the expander ball, mm -hmm. right? And that's what that's doing is that's is when you sh shove a piece of brass up in there, the first is it's, it's, it's sizing the outside diameter of it and reforming it to what the chamber specs are. 
And then as you pull it down, it's got an expander ball and it's pulling through that neck. And the expander ball is what controls the neck tension for that and sizes the neck for that bullet to sit into. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. It, so he doesn't clean it. He doesn't clean his brass after he, he reloads it. No, he, he just shoots. Oh, that's, oh, he, that's a no, no. Tell him that's a no, no. <laughs> really? Okay. Well, it can cause, I mean, so grease is fluid, right? I mean, that can cause pressure problems. Um, also is, uh, it depends what type of, um, not grease, but lubricant, uh, is a fluid it, it, that could potentially cause powder contamination, primer contamination. Um, so it depends what he's, he's using, I guess, for lube. Interesting. See, so, the, and this is all like, Hey, someone's going to hear this podcast and be like, Oh, I didn't know that. I'll make sure yeah. to make sure to do that. So after you size your brass, then tumble it again or clean it again or whatever. Or Yeah. Yeah, so I can go through kind of like a basic step-by-step if you want. Yeah, bring it. Okay, so if I get brand new brass, um, the first thing I do is um, if it's not annealed, I anneal it. I don't care. I just anneal it. Um, If it is uh, brass, let's just let's just let's let's start with uh, twice fired brass. Okay, I take my uh, my bucket of 100 twice fired brass. I dump it into my stainless steel wet tumbler. Okay. Mm -hmm which is from Frank Fryer. So I went tumble that for 20 minutes. That gets it all clean. Most of the time when you're not running, when you're running a bolt gun or not a gas gun, your brass doesn't really get terribly dirty. And, and then you, so it's not falling on the ground, you know, usually you can pick it right up and put it in your pouch or whatever. And so I, t- I tumble that and then I throw it into my food dehydrator <laughs> to dry it. <laughs> I, then I, then I, then Pro I, then I, <laughs> <laughs> yep, but I, because otherwise you get a lot of wetness everywhere, and then your powder's wet, your primer's wet, everything like that. Always dry your brass after. Um, sometimes I will decap. Uh, decapping is where you t- kick the primer out be- before I clean. It just depends on my process or what I'm doing. If it's just for my M1A1 308, I don't care about my primer pockets, but let's let's say I'm doing it for some precision stuff. I will decap them and then throw them into that Frankfurt Arsenal and then dry them, and then I anneal. And then I set up my sizing die. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't size like most people. Some people use neck bushings or just a full length sizing die. I use the expander mantle and everything. So I take that expander ball we were talking about. I take that out of the die. I run it. I run it up into the to the to the press. Um, the next step is the expander mandrel, and then I uh, usually I want right around two neck two thousand neck tension. So I go with let's say your bullet. You know you're staying with three hundred eight. Your bullet is a point um, three oh eight, so I usually go with I expand around and roll of point three zero seven or point three zero six five, mm-hmm. and that that's kind of where I hang in there. And then I go into trimming and deburring and cleaning the flash holes if I want. And then you're into prime, you're into priming. And there's a lot of different methods to priming. And there's also you can also go down rabbit trails. Of, do you do you see your primer flush? Do you, you know, go with, do you do 2000s crush, but you know, in there, 4000s crush I've done, I've literally done over 4,000 different cartridge rounds with just primer testing. So I have an opinion on that, but I'll, I'll keep that. I'll keep that to myself. Um, <laughs> I, uh, because a lot of people, a lot of people say, Oh, as long as you can't feel it, you're good. Um, yes, there is that you're, you're, you should be good. Um, but there's there's different methods like Frank for Arsenal makes a, a hand primer where you can adjust the seating depth. And I literally went to the range and shot and shot and shot and shot and shot. Um, I tested accuracy. I tested velocity. I tested the exchange, but all that stuff oh, over several different times, different periods, different days. And primer seating depth does make a difference. That may just be on your rifle, though, whatever it makes a difference at. Because different firing pins have different springs and all that stuff. Um I prefer to use a hand primer or a bench top primer. I never prime on my press unless I am doing pistol brass on a progressive press. Um, I like, I feel like I can feel it better in my hand. It's so figuring out that primer pocket is getting worn out. They do make no go gauges for the primer pocket, but I do not want to sit on every stinking piece of brass and do a no go gauge. That's extremely repetitive. Yeah. Yeah, that um, I'm meticulous, but I ain't that meticulous. So you can feel it, and then also Forrester makes a really nice bench top primer, and you can feel that too. How 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 snug it is going in, um, and then you're to throw in your powder and your bullets. So um, that's kind of like the the basics, the basically the basically way, the most basic way you can do that. Mm. 
So you're not uh, my tri- opinion. You're trimming your brass in there at some point, right? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I said that. Uh, I thought I said chamfer, a trim, chamfer, and deburr. Okay, gotcha. Okay. So I size it. So yeah, I size it. Um, I check first. So I actually I 3D print. I make these little gauges and um, I stick it in there. And if my finger, I f- run my finger over it. And if it is, uh, if I catch on my finger or a piece of paper, then it's time to trim. If not, I dump right out. And I go again. Dump, dump, dump. Yeah, because I do the basically what's for the max case length. Yeah. Of that. Dude, 3D so, yeah. printing is is bomb because those are expensive if you're going to actually buy the uh, case length oh, fitters yeah. for each caliber. Oh, I know. And I, 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 I'll I, plug again, but I like I make it for $6. And like normally you're like $35 for one of them, right? Uh-huh. But yeah, so yeah. That's why I got into 3D printing because I was out here reloading. And uh, I was like, man, it'd be nice to have this. Oh, man, it'd be nice to have this. I bet yeah, I can make this. <laughs> and so... I looked at it and I bought myself a 3D printer and now I own a lot of them. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Sweet. Hey, give a shout yeah. out to your Etsy channel or your Etsy uh, uh, store. Yeah, it's it's Extruded Customs. I do a lot of um, uh, reloading content or reloading stuff on there. Uh, shotgun reloading, normal reloading stuff. Um, and then I, like, you you know, you showed on your story, the uh, on your Instagram story, those Garmin boxes. I When I bought that Garmin and it showed up in a, cardboard box i was like hmm six hundred dollars for a unit and i do not want to drop this and so i was like what can i do yeah yeah and so i was like i designed that and i was like yeah that's much better so those are i'm like those are selling like crazy which is awesome Mm -hmm. so phenomenal yeah they're easy to use and very they're perfect almost like yeah yeah and it's cheap like I'm like I think I like the only competitor is someone on Amazon, and I think I'm cheaper than the competitor on Amazon. Yeah. So I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> that works. <laughs> I so, love it. I love it. Okay, yeah. so that's your basic reloading process. You're just yep. going through that. Um, go beyond. I did. Re- I did real quick. I did forget. I I do clean my brass. I clean my brass after I size it. I throw it in rice. So I have a I, because with this whole this whole conversation started, and I completely <laughs> skipped it. So I throw it, I throw it in rice in a, in a, just a dry tumbler. I just drop it in there for three minutes and it cleans all the lube off. That's how I do it. Okay. So that's, that's after sizing. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I was like, I was like, I was like, oh shoot. I completely forgot about that. So yeah. Uh, Um, real quick, let's talk about primers there. You Mm -hmm. know, it seems like nowadays between finding the correct powder or finding primers is your hardest thing. Is, yep. is a primer a primer or is no. does it it really makes a difference you know there's magnum there's not magnum some call them br2s br4s like what what is everything so from my understanding like a match primer or a bench rest primer is the same primer as your basic primer it's just got more eyes on it going through the plant so their quality control on it is better um I, I believe it is the same primer compound in there, the same cup and the same anvil. It's just got better quality assurance around those. Mm-hmm. They charge, they charge a little bit more for them. Um, have I noticed a difference in a BR primer over a normal CCI primer? No. Um, now when you're talking magnum i have noticed a difference and i don't know if that's just because like a magnum primer com- you know match magnum primer compared to a normal magnum primer i don't know if that's just because there's a little more variance in play you've got more powder and stuff like that usually that could be it um and you do not when when a reloading book calls out that you're to use a a magnum car- a magnum primer you want to use that magnum primer the whole point of it is um let's let's take a 30-06 it's right on the edge of being a magnum cartridge and a standard cartridge you could use a magnum cartridge or a magnum primer in a 30-06 but it will be hotter so therefore you could have pressure signs Hmm. i have noticed so loading 8.6 blackout um, i've done some testing with standard large rifle primers and standard magnum primers my velocity and my extreme spreads are always tighter on magnum primers than with standard primers interesting so and there's different there's different cup thicknesses on the primers depending what you're using like you don't want to substitute pistol primers like small pistol for small rifle don't do that 
Um, the primer, I mean, the, you know, the firing pins are different. Um, you could probably get away with it in a pinch, but you don't want to do it. It's not something, it's not worth it. Fascinating. So, it feels yeah. like I can, I've been going to local sporting goods stores down here in Texas. I see mm-hmm. small rifle primers on the shelves often. Yep. Uh, I see some pistol primers. I never see large rifle primers. Uh, they're, they're, a lot of them are going overseas right now. Really? Thanks a lot. And, <laughs> yeah. And, well, I mean, they're being loaded in cartridges, right? I mean, you got to think like, you know, what does a machine gun run? Large, <laughs> large rifle primers, right? Yeah. That's usually, you know, belt fed guns you're running a large rifle primer. So, I mean, that's a lot of what it is. That's where, you know, like if you're looking for Alliant powders, like Reloader 26, because obviously Hornady can't get it either. Um, it's all going overseas, you know, yeah. um, war, war is more of a demand. You know, they got to fill those contracts over. They're going to fill, you know, to the average person. So, um, and the other thing too, is they're still fill, filling the demand for factory ammo. So we're going to be kind of on the, we're the third option when it comes handlers. We're the third option when it comes to it, but I have been seeing, I've been seeing federal large rifle primers on the shelf. You got to be quick about it though, because word gets out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So when it comes to so many different variabilities for reloading, mm-hmm. where would you point people to start when it comes to you want just the most accurate round on a beginner stage? I would say open up your Nosler Hornady Sierra Burger book, read the front section of that book. If you're loading a Nosler bullet, read that front front section. It's going to give you a ton of info on that bullet, how that bullet likes to shoot. Um, and, you know, it also gives you a recommendation on where to seat that bullet for your case overall length, right? Gives you a recommendation on where you're going to trim that brass to. And also in Nosler, you, I mean, you had that book up. And if I remember right, it shows their most accurate tested load. Mm-hmm. So if you, if you were to open that up, I think it's got a, like a little gold or bronze thing and says this was the most accurate load tested. Um, it, you can, if you got that powder and bullet, I would start from there because I have found that has been some of the best stuff following Nosler's book. Interesting. Not, not only that, but everybody loves speed. Sometimes, sometimes speed is not the most accurate. Uh, actually, a lot of times speed is not the most accurate. And then you got to look, think of the, you know, the other thing is, is like, Hey, am I loading at sea level here? And I'm going to go hunt at 12,000 feet. And is it going to be 90 degrees? And I'm testing at 45 degrees. Your pressure is going to be different too. So sometimes it's even better just to start low. And if that thing shoots great, it shoots great. Like, so a perfect example is, is that 30 out six I was talking about. I shoot a 168 grain Barnes TSX. It's my, my mule deer slayer. It, it kills like everything I've shot at it. And it, literally is 150 feet slower than what I could get it to shoot, but it shoots half inch groups all day long at 150 feet slower. If I bump it up, I'm getting around an inch to inch and a quarter. Well, I would, I will sacrifice that velocity because I can hold over for 150 feet. Right. Um, you not necessarily need the velocity. Now with a Barnes bullet, you need velocity for that to expand, but I'm still pushing it. And good speeds coming out of that 30 out six for a 168 grain. And I've killed mule deer 350 yards in with that thing with no problem. And that's that's hunting distance. You're gonna whatever you're if you're you know, you should be able to should be able to kill anything you're hunting at 350 yards. And if you're basically at 2600 feet per second at that range, you should be good. Mm. So fascinating. Yeah. Okay. What is a ladder test? Something I don't do, but we can talk about it. Um, a ladder test is where you start at charge weight and work your way up. You can do that in, uh, one, you know, you can do it as many rounds as you want. There's a, a Scott Satterley method that a lot of people will do where they'll, they'll start with one chart, one round and go load 10 and they'll work their way up in like two tenths increments. And they look for this accuracy node. Um, I don't do that because I don't feel like it's enough data to represent what I'm looking for. Um, a lot, and then you can do where you can go shoot three shots. Well, three shots is going to give you an idea how it might shoot, but you know what? You might shoot that three shot and it might shoot like amazing, a quarter inch group. And the next one, next, next one, say you're going to 0.5 increments and next one goes up. You started at 40. That's one shot. Amazing. You went to 40.5 and it opened to like three quarter inch group. Next one, uh, you shoot 
uh, you know, to 41 and it, and it shoots a little smaller or vice versa. So basically you're starting at a certain charge weight and you're going to work your way up to that maximum charge weight that you want to achieve. And you should be me- you should be measuring velocity while you're doing that. So you can see what you're getting and what your recommend, what the recommended velocity would have been for that. Um, that's basically a ladder test. And why do you not do it? Uh, it's not enough data. It's not enough data. Yep. I'm a firm believer and, and because I've been doing it and I've seen results. Um, I mean, I keep, I thought about doing a video on it where I go out and do a ladder test and I shoot three, three to five shot groups and not, con- and don't confirm it. Because I'll be, I'll be honest with you. Most people I know, they don't confirm it. Once they shoot, you know, a three inch, they go out and shoot it and it shoots three shot group. And they're like, Oh, it shoots great. And they go out and shoot at a deer at 400 yards and they blow the leg off the deer, you know? Um, I'm trying not to insult anybody here <laughs> because I know there's a ton of people that do this, but it's, it's, it's just not enough data to say that's what your, your rifle's capable of because what you're doing is, is you gotta, you gotta take that rifle and you've got to put it through. It's a little bit of a, 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 not a stress test, but a test of where you're going to see how it's going to do. So if I go do a ladder test, I would go out and shoot a five shot group at a ladder test. Okay. And then I'd say, okay, I picked the one that shot the best. I will also look at my extreme spreads and my standard deviations and my velocity. Okay. I go, okay, that's pretty good. Well, let's go shoot a five by five where it's five shots, five different targets. And I'm going to take that and take an average. That is representative of what that group was from a ladder test. And that's only 25 rounds. Right. So that any one of those shots could have been that shot on that animal. Mm-hmm. Does that makes sense. Yeah. That that's why I don't do if I do, if I were to do a ladder test, that's how I would do it. But the problem is most people don't don't do it that way. Well, I, I feel like most people. Is good enough, like eight inch kill group size, what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. And because mm-hmm. because what it sounds like is multiple trips to the range back yep. before you're even just getting yeah. you know your gun sighted in yeah oh yeah i mean like what's hilarious is i posted videos and the guy's like you're not even hitting the bullseye well my that's where i was aiming but my point of impact was here that's because i'm testing <laughs> it will be zeroed and dialed if that's the goal but it's it's funny how the perception of certain stuff is right and what's amazing, you might think that thing shoots great at 100, but you never tested at 200. You never tested at 300 or even say 500 where you think you're going to shoot that animal. You know, you might get a lot of vertical spreading that you're never going to see at 100 yards. So if, if you're going to go, if you're going to go out and use that load, you have to shoot what you're going to shoot that, that what you feel at that range, right? Mm-hmm. Um so if you're going to shoot at 600 yards, you better go find your place to shoot 600 yards because, and if you're getting a lot of vertical stringing, then you, then something is off on that. You want horizontal or a kind of like a, a clover leaf diamond pattern, right? Yeah. That's kind of what you want. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was on your YouTube channel, uh, reloading quest today. And yeah. you were talking about this brand new rifle that you got from Kelbley's. The, yeah, the that thing uh, is sexy. <laughs> Yeah, the Nanook. Uh, what is it? The yeah. Nanook PH rifle. PH? Yeah, yeah. seven PRC. Well, dude, yeah. talk to me about that. That thing looks sweet. Uh, it's awesome. I have not shot it yet, but I've I've got a scope that is going to be going on. I got a track scope that's going to be going on that. Um, yeah, I'm excited to shoot it. It's got, I believe, 26 inch barrel on it, carbon fiber barrel. Trigger on it is amazing. I really like the stock. Uh, Mc, McManor stock, I believe, is yep. right. Right? Am yep. I right on that? Yep, Manor stock. I don't have all the details right here. No, but, it's okay. Uh, I mean, you don't you don't have to be the yeah. the ad guy for it. But um, it just... it, it's 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 impressive. Um, it's it's a very it's not a crazy lightweight rifle, but it's light enough. I mean, you don't. I mean, it's a Magnum cartridge. You don't want the thing to be super light. Um, I have. Let's just say I have high hopes for it. Yeah. Um. I'm hope I'm hoping I'm not disappointed, but I, I, I don't, I don't think I will be. Have you started reloading for seven PRC already? Yes, I have, uh, I have seven PRC in, uh, Ruger American go wild. 
and that thing shoots amazing and i get great and i get great velocity and i have original horny ammo that shot that's uh, awesome. the original velocity too oh so, okay do you have yeah. to uh switch up your loads for each individual rifle or it... yes you will yes okay you will most likely i mean you might have a cartridge that shoots really well in the same rifles um i have six three out six is not a single one of them likes the same load mm. barrels are like women they're finicky man yeah man they're just <laughs> yeah <laughs> Sometimes and sometimes there's no way to please them. So, <laughs> and then and then you know what you do with that? You put it back away on the shelf and say, yeah. you know, you're yeah. fun to like, look at, but you're not that much fun to take out. Or you or you rebarrel it and you get rid of it. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, that's funny. Um, okay, so so that's kind of what what's going on with you in reloading is there any questions that you think i missed that you feel like uh, someone who's diving into reloading to get started will need to know i don't i don't know about that you missed but if i could give like basically just basic advice spend your money on good quality reloading equipment if you got a friend that reloads ask him ask him what he likes ask him what he don't like about this press or is any of his equipment or shoot, you might be able to get reloading equipment from him that he's like done with. Mm -hmm. And then you can even figure out if you even enjoy it. Because if you go spend two thousand dollars on a reloading equipment and hate it, well, you just made somebody on Facebook very happy because they're gonna get a very good deal. Yep. I know because I buy stuff off Facebook all the time. <laughs> and I I and it's usually when I go talk to somebody, oh what I was like, I just didn't enjoy it. Because it's not for everybody, right? I, you know, um, and a lot of people get into it thinking that they might save money. Well, you will eventually, or you got to shoot a lot to get there. So it just depends on what you want. And if it there, but there is something about man, just like loading your own ammo and going and getting that animal with your own ammo. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's super cool. It's there's there's nothing like it. It's it's pretty cool. I, I will so. say I have that experience. My very okay. first animal, the black bear in the state of Washington, yep. nine miles deep, I ended mm -hmm. up shooting it with a 308 uh, hand load yep. of my own. Yep. And from start to finish, it was dude, the cartridge I put together. Yep. You can take pride did, in it too. Did the job. Yeah. You you can take pride in it and it, it's just cool. Yeah. It's like I said, it's not for everybody, but basically you you if if you don't enjoy sitting down and spending some time at a bench it's not for you um but if it's something that you think you can get into go hang out with a buddy that might do it and maybe pick a few tips with him or go and say hey can i come watch you reload or hey can you show me a few tips um and if you're like oh man this looks fun this looks interesting i really want to do it buy quality equipment otherwise you're going to be selling your equipment and you're going to be buying different equipment buy what? buy buy what is quality? What is quality equipment? What brands do you recommend staying away from or staying or going towards? Or I know this, this is where <laughs> you. It's okay. <laughs> I, I'm not sponsored by anybody. <laughs> I have people that send me stuff, but I'm not sponsored by anybody. Um, if you're going to buy a progress, progress, uh, progressive press, Dylan is the way to go. Um, their warranties are amazing. It's just outstanding. Or the Hornady press. Both of those guys have it dialed when it comes to quality and warranty. It's amazing. Uh, it, it's pretty incredible. Now, RCBS just got bought by Hodgins, so I'm not sure about them, but they were also amazing. I've broken a couple things. I have an RCBS press that's progressive, and I broke a couple things on that, and I had the replacement part in two days. Wow. Yes. So, um, in my opinion, there's – like for your average reloader, there's three main companies I would go with. I'd go Dylan if you want progressive. If you want a single stage, I would go with Hornady or RCBS. I am not a fan of a turret press. Are you familiar with those? Mm -mm. Nope. Although the 409 turret press is pretty nice. I don't have one, but I hear it's like the press. It's amazing, I guess. But basically how it works is it's a turret on top where you can have all your dies and you can have different stages where you can turn it. Well, the two turret presses I've ever had had so much slop and play up there. It just, I didn't like it, and I constantly had to be tinkering with it to fix it, and it wasn't producing very good ammo. So um, those are that was a Redding and a Lightman, and so I just tossed those aside. Um, if I were to go with 
if I wanted to go and say money was no option, yeah, you could probably go with that that uh, turret press from Area 409, 4, 409 right? That's what it's called. Um, or I know Short Action Custom just came out the new press, which I'm supposed to be getting next month from them. That oh. apparently is pretty nice. Um, if you're gonna, if you want to stay away from anything, uh, if you like plastic, buy Lee. If you don't like plastic, don't buy Lee. <laughs> Good to know. How about this? When it comes to dies, um, what's the difference between a match set die and just regular dies? Or is one brand's die better than others besides the fact that their boxes stack better together? <laughs> well, I make 3D printing things for those too. But yeah, uh, I have, if you saw my bench in there, it's actually hilarious. I have 87 different cartridges I, I reload for. And so I have just shelves like stacked of dies. Um, I love, love, love Forrester, Redding, and Hornady dies. Those are the, my main three dies. Lee does make good dies. If you want to buy a die set for $45, there ain't nothing wrong with their dies. Now, I have stuck more pieces of brass in Lee dies. And if you take a bore scope and look up in Lee dies, you might see more tooling marks. Um, I know people say that about uh, Redding, though, and I've never had that problem. Hmm. So, you know, it could be certain lots of stuff, right? Uh, Forrester makes really good stuff, although I'm kind of stuck on Hornady dies because they came out with their new di their click dial indicator. That is amazing, and it can you can literally fit on any other Hornady custom dies. You can it's it's like to the thou. I mean, it's super precision for seating seating stuff. It's pretty incredible. Now, when you get into match grade dies or versus basic dies or bushing dies. Uh, Redding makes probably the best bushing die sets. Um, or you've got, um, but I don't, I personally don't use bushing die sets. I use expander mandrels and those are all, I get those from 21st century. So a lot of it has to do with the tolerance and the chamber kind of thing. So, you know, everything, all your dies, standard dies should be to Sammy spec, unless you send it out to get custom, you know, ground, like you set a piece of brass out. And they can custom make that die to basically to your chamber once it's been fired, which makes for very accurate custom. That will help you a lot if that's something you're into. Wow, I didn't even know that was an option. Oh yeah, there's companies that do it. I think, I think Hornady still does it. It's pretty cheap. I, they may, I, I think they still do it. There's a couple companies that do it. Yeah, man, that's but cool. It, if if you're looking to stay in, you know, the fifty dollar price range, buy yourself a Hornady die set of Hornady dies, and you won't be disappointed. If you're buying new, what's the average cost to get into a reloading? Like a starter. Sing, a starter. For, let's, let, let's say we want to do some 223 or 300 blackout. You're going to be looking at, um, you know, it, you, can go, you can go as cheap or as little as you want, you know, as much as you want. Um, you, I, you're going to be probably $500 for a good kit. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think you, anybody should buy the actual loading kits because there's stuff in there you'll use and there's stuff in there that you want. So you can go on to like Gavin, Gavin Tube, which is an ultimate loader, right? Um, he was also at uh, the at Shot Show at, at Twenty Two Creedmoor dinner. Um, he does an amazing job of explaining like all the stuff and costs, and that guy blows me away on some of the stuff he does. It's pretty impressive. Um, but you can get into a really good loading set for six hundred dollars. Ain't bad. No. no, but you know what? Go buy one used from somebody off of facebook craigslist and make sure you like it you know but if you're like hey i got six hundred dollars just or you can go buy a new set but i tell i so i tell a lot of people a lot of friends want to get a reloading i said go buy a new or used or, or go load with a buddy make sure you even like it um or if you're just stubborn and you're like oh no i'm gonna like it go buy your go go spend six hundred dollars and buy yourself a nice set of hornady or a hornady press or rcbs press yeah that's what that's what i do buy yourself our CBS rock checker or buy yourself the Hornady iron press and you'll, and you'll be a thing will last you your lifetime. Yeah. That's awesome. if it doesn't, it's amazing warranty. If anything breaks, you'll see it within a week. Right. So impressive. I love it. I love it. Um, I want to ask you a question because this is a soul seekers podcast. We're always talking yep. about the soul yep. and, and how hunting transforms lives and all that. Since you started hunting at a young age, you've gotten into reloading. You love to hunt consistently. Um, mm -hmm. 
how has hunting transformed your life? Um, oh, that's a good question. You know, uh, it probably makes me a more ethical person just in general, because, huh. you know, really, I mean, whatever you're doing hunting, you know, you need to be ethical. You need to be responsible and all that should transform over into your daily life. You know, you should um, do the right thing when nobody's watching hunting or not. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, that deer might've just jumped, you know, jumped that fence. Oh, I can shoot it and drag it across. Well, that's not the right thing. Right. You know, that, that goes for the same thing in, you know, normal life. Well, is someone really going to see me take the Snickers bar kind of thing? You know, right. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? So I don't know, maybe just like, no, that's a good question. I, that's probably what it is. Just more of the, honesty and knowing you're doing always doing the right thing and what's what's best for really for the animal is really best for you and eating good meat not meat not meat that's going through like tons of different tra hormonal transfers <laughs> or, or even 3d printed meat have you heard about that no that sounds disgusting <laughs> It is. I love how, your answer, how, by the way. I've ne no one's ever said that before. It's really interesting. That's why I was like, huh, okay, interesting. Okay, yeah. I mean, like, really. I mean, because you know, I've met a lot of very unethical hunters. I've hunted with them, and I I have never gone back with them. Right. I mean, like, I'll be honest. You learn a lot about somebody if you hunt with them for a few days, and you're stuck with them alone in the woods. You find out you, true colors come out of a person, in my opinion. Yeah. You find out a lot about somebody. Yeah, I would agree. You may you may make a lifelong lifelong friend, or you may make a friend that that you wanted to bury up there. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, that's why so, I always talk about hunting has the power to transform lives because even yeah, you just go through that experience, you're gonna learn a lot about yourself and the people you're with. Oh yeah, well you figure out how tough you are. I mean, depend depend on what kind of hunt you you're doing. I mean, you find out a lot about yourself. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah. Um, what type of hunting do you got planned for this fall? <laughs> well, um, I get to go to Africa. Uh, so, uh, so August really isn't fall, but I'm going to Africa, um, August, uh, 24th. Yeah. So go there. I'm there for 10 days. I'm going with Hornady and Horizon Firearms. So we're going to go, uh, some shoot some planes game with 22 Creedmoor and possibly 22 Arc. Heck so. yeah. Yeah, and then uh, next week I leave for Wyoming for prairie dog, some prairie dog hunting. Doing that with uh, Hornady as well. So um, for fall hunting, probably um, because I'm going to be gone so much upcoming, um, I, I will be doing a, bear hunting is my main thing. Um, August 1st, that's what I'm doing. Heck yeah. <laughs> that's for some, like... I love turkey hunting. I love mule deer hunting, but I love how long the bear season is. So I can literally get off work and it's still light out, right? I can run up on the hill yep. and go hunt. Yep. Um, and so that's so. And on mule deer hunting, I'm bear hunting at the same time. So I'm really, I'm really bear hunting and hoping to shoot a mule deer is what's going on. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, uh, yeah. So that's kind of probably those two. Uh, I may, um, I probably. I may elk hunt for a spike. We'll see this year. Um, I always get deprivation tags for cow every year in January. So we'll see. I may do that too, but um, that's kind of what I got planned. So I was planning, I was planning to come down to Texas in uh, October, um, but I'm going to have to skip out on that thing. Cause I got a family thing that came up. Oh, but bummer. yeah. Bummer. Yeah. That's, but there's, right. always, that's there's always next year. I need to, I, my one thing is I have not hunted that. I always wanted to hunt is boar. So I need to figure out a place to come hunt boar in Texas. Well, so I might know a guy. Okay. I might, <laughs> I might know a guy or two. Yeah. <laughs> so I love it. Yeah. I love yeah. it. Brother, thank you so much for coming on, sharing your knowledge, your experience and all that. It's really impressive. And it's, I can tell from, you know, I podcast with a lot of different people. I have a lot of different conversa conversations. When someone hits their bread and butter of what they love and know is. Yeah. It's just, it shows and it shows okay. with you. And so I, I wish your YouTube channel and all your endeavors, just the best yeah. success ever, because, um, you're, you're doing it. It's, it's, it's meaningful and, uh, you're helping people along the way. It's really awesome. Yeah. 
Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. So, yeah. all you listeners, go check out uh, Reloading Quest on YouTube and uh, hit that subscribe button. Go check out all the cool videos. Do you have any uh, videos that you would point the listeners to to go check out first? Uh, for like basics reloading stuff, um, it's been hard to put reloading stuff up right now just because the way uh, YouTube well, YouTube's been cra- yeah, yeah, cracking down. Um, but there's a lot of uh, 30-06 content on there that transpo- transforms over to a lot of different stuff. Same with 6-Arc. So if you're you know looking at 6-Arc stuff or you know, 3-06, um, the nice thing about reloading, it really, depending you know on the car- whatever the cartridge is, it really translates to the next one. So it um, just kind of depends what you like seeing. Um, if you just like seeing test results of what I'm doing, that's what it's there for. Because, I mean, I started it uh year before covid and i was like how do i how do i share like my information that i'm passionate about with people that without having them in my garage with me mm-hmm. um and that's just basically why i started it it was mainly just kind of almost more just like video blogging i guess at that point um but it's turned into more and youtube pays me a little bit extra money every now and then so i'll take <laughs> i'll t- I'll, t- I'll take that google money anytime i can get it <laughs> so sticking it to the man and uh yeah <laughs> i love it so I love it, brother. Well, best of luck this coming season. Uh, can't wait to hear about your results in Africa, and good luck getting a bear. You know that is near and dear to the heart here at Soul Seeker. And, yep. uh, man, if you ever have any anything that I can help you with, please reach out. I'd love to get you on some hogs down here in Texas. Yeah. Um, I've been actually getting them showing up during the daytime lately. So Really? Okay. Yeah, which is unusual usually you know they they the texas heat keeps them hidden yeah. until until the cool of the evening so um brother thank you so much for coming on everybody go check out the youtube channel subscribe to it go check them out you're on instagram as well uh, under the reloading yep. quest yep yep awesome exactly all right guys thank you so much for listening if you liked it give it a thumbs up subscribe share it uh let us know i'd love to hear feedback and and getting information from you listeners as much as possible remember that hunting has the power to transform lives through primal adventure and that you can never outgive good as mentorship is conservation a part of that mentorship today is talking about reloading and you and the ammo in which we use to hunt be blessed i'm johnny mack for zach may of reloading quest freedom on everybody and stay soulful If you enjoyed today's podcast and want to support the show, you can always like, share, subscribe, and leave a rating as it helps us share our mission of mentorship as conservation. Thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of Soul Seekers Nation as we transform lives through primal adventure. If you want to get more connected with the podcast, check out the Soul Seekers Nation Facebook group as I look forward to connecting with you on the next episode. So stay tuned and stay soulful.